I'm Tamara Kandacker, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. So last week at the Wall Street Journal's Future of Everything Festival, the CEO of WeWork, Sandeep Mathrani, made some comments that annoyed a lot of people. He was talking about what offices should expect after the pandemic is over, and he said those who are overly engaged with the company want to go to the office two-thirds of the time at least, and that those who are least engaged are very comfortable working from home. The comments didn't sit well with a lot of people, obviously, since WeWork's business is all about leasing out office space, and they got a ton of backlash online. But the question of whether employees work better or worse from home is one that a lot of companies are grappling with right now as more and more people get vaccinated and they're thinking about how and when to bring them back to the office. Many of us who've been working from home for the last 15 months are also wondering, what's next? Do we want to go back to the office and let go of the flexibility, or is that a sacrifice we're willing to make for the sake of feeling less lonely and bringing back some boundaries between work and life? The pandemic has accelerated good things about the future of work, and it's also shone a light on many of the downsides. Zabine Hirji is the executive advisor on the future of work for Deloitte. She's been working with companies and their chief human resource officers, or CHROs as she calls them, to help them navigate all this. Today on the show, what Canadian companies are saying about the future of work from home. So Zabine, you advise Deloitte and its clients on the changing nature of work, and you talk to a lot of organizations about how they're going to be approaching this. So what's your sense of where we're going to land in terms of how many employers will keep people working from home? Let me just start with a little bit of uh, quick context here. According to Stats Canada, about 40% of Canadian workers are in jobs that can be done at least partly from home or another location for that matter. So really what we're talking about here is 40% of workers because 60% of jobs can't be done from home. What's going to happen post-pandemic? Most organizations are talking about adopting a hybrid model, Mm -hmm. which is a mix of work from home and from the office. You know, I speak regularly to uh, CHROs in large organizations, and there I would say it's going to be over 80% where they're going to have this hybrid model. There are a few organizations that have publicly declared digital by default, and they're going to be working mostly from home. And there are a few that have said, we're going to go back to pre-pandemic levels. Mm -hmm. A lot of small and medium-sized businesses You know, those that have 20, 50, 200 employees make up a large proportion of employers. And I think in that group, we will see slightly lower adoption than in the larger organizations. What do employees say? Do they want to come back to the office? So at the moment, it is that 20-60-20 is the sort of headline where 20% of them want to work remotely after the pandemic. 60% want a hybrid, and 20% actually want to work mostly from the office. One of the interesting findings that I think surprised a lot of people is that younger people are very keen to come back to the office. Hmm. The office is a place also where they meet colleagues, there's uh, socialization that takes place, And it's also where their careers are developed, where they have opportunities to learn informally from others around them, where they have opportunity to engage informally with more senior people to, you know, not only learn from them, but also to be able to demonstrate their capabilities Yeah, I can definitely see how it would be beneficial for younger people to get back into the office. And I want to get into those reasons a little bit more in just a bit. But what about organizations, just top line observations? What are they concerned about when it comes to letting people keep working from home 100 percent of the time? The top issue for CEOs here is culture. There is a very strong belief and also experience over the last year 
that culture is really critical to the success of an organization. It's quite intangible, but it's become more tangible through the pandemic. Other things that also pop up for organizations are building a sense of belonging. Belonging is a really important aspect of performance. Mm -hmm. uh, when people feel like they belong to an organization, they're part of something bigger, it's really a place then where they bring their best to work and where organizations can help them unlock their potential and be their best. And the third one is around creativity and innovation. Just from sitting together and being together, you can't mm -hmm. plan those things. So I guess in summary, this shift towards a hybrid model is coming from both employers and employees for different reasons. And let's just get into some of those. I'm someone who has definitely benefited a lot from working from home because nine to five in an office doesn't really give you much time for yourself if you also have to commute to work and you don't, you know, there are days where you actually don't finish work at 5 p.m. So before the pandemic, I was really struggling to get any exercise, to cook for myself, to get outside. But now I am able to do these things way more. And I imagine it's the same for other people. And obviously, I have to acknowledge that this is a very privileged position to be in because a lot of people can't work from home. But I wonder, with all these people who've now experienced this new, like having that extra bit of time and all the things that you can do with it, is it even possible to make people go back to working in an office nine to five? And what are you hearing from employers about this expectation of flexibility that's been created over the last little while? Well, flexibility and choice are the key words. Employers will have to be flexible and provide choice and, you know, freedom within a framework is the way that I think about it. It can't be, you know, I can't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I don't feel like going in today. There is a framework because people have working together, working in a common space is something that's required and, and uh, will have to be done in some sort of planned way. The challenge is going to be more in figuring out how to practically make it work. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the focus needs to shift to, not the should we or exactly how much, but how and what do we need to do? What can we learn and together make it work? Yeah. What kind of advice are you giving to employers about how to make that balance work? And I guess the other question is, have you heard any ideas from employers about how they're planning to do this? Number one is to work collaboratively with employees because you have a common goal. The other thing that is important is in the physical spaces, we can't go back to what it was before, not just because of the health and safety concerns. In some ways, that's easier mm -hmm. to address because there is a playbook for that. But it's also about creating a space where community building and collaboration can happen. How are you going to change learning and mentoring and coaching? Because that's another thing that people are concerned about is if I'm working from home and my colleagues are working from the office, am I going to be at a disadvantage for career opportunities? Is out of sight, out of mind going to become an issue? Yeah. But you also touched on when they're going to work. Mm -hmm. So while we're talking a lot about where people will work. I don't think we're talking enough about flex time. And uh, that's something that organizations will need to build in and perhaps think of what are the core hours that people are working so you can get a hold of them. Right. And then the rest is trust your employees to do it. Move to an outcomes and output based measurement of productivity and performance versus, oh, Tamara's in the office, so she must be productive. On the productivity question, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, it was a big fear that we would not be as productive working from home. I personally have found that I'm much more productive working from home but what does the research say and how is that factoring into the decisions that are being made right now? Most of the research in this area has been done by asking employees to indicate the productivity levels. 
And people are working longer hours,、mm-hmm. a lot by you know one or two hours a day. Some people are using their commute time to work. Yeah. So, part of this increase in productivity related to people working more, and the challenge that we have of unless you're very deliberate about it, of your work and life just blending together. And that's not sustainable. We know that people are starting to really—they're starting to burn out. There's just the work, work, work is becoming an issue. The Globe did a story about why that might be, and one of the reasons that the story brought up was that a lot of workers are trying to prove their value when they're working from home because they're so much less visible outside of the office. It's almost the sense of guilt that they have, and they feel like they should work more. And one of the concerns that was brought up in the story is that there are a lot of anecdotes about people who are feeling more stress, more fatigue. And I wonder if you can talk a bit about the knock-on effects of working so much more. Yeah, so glad you brought that up. This is a C-suite agenda item, just in terms of mental health and well-being, the sustainability. We've still got a ways to go. There are sort of two sets of actions. One is a little bit more systemic, and I'm sure you've seen organizations that have declared. In fact, Deloitte they've really encouraged people to not have meetings on Friday afternoons.、Hmm. And another thing that I find quite interesting that they've done, which is also about changing culture, is they have provided everyone with an extra day off over the three upcoming long weekends. So what that you know essentially means people will have four day weekends, but everyone will be off at that time. Now they're in a business where that can be done, but when everyone is off, the work actually shuts down a little bit more, and you don't get as many emails or expectations、yeah. of joining meetings, etc. And it starts to set a tone that frequent short bursts of rest are a good thing, and it's something that's. Good for employees and good for business and changing that culture. For me, the dream is that mental health is treated the same as physical health in terms of how we support it.、Mm-hmm. So, kind of related to mental health, our colleagues actually recently did a story on the breakdowns being experienced by white collar workers, and there was one stat in particular that I thought was pretty shocking. So. According to Morneau Chappelle, forty percent of managers and finance and professional services have considered leaving their jobs since the pandemic started, which、mm-hmm. is an unexpected development because people who can work from home have been, you know, largely protected from the economic devastation of the pandemic.、Mm-hmm. And some of the feelings, according to the piece, can be partly explained by the disappearance of social connections that made. Really long and intense work days, a little bit more tolerable. So now work and home life blend into one, and we also don't have things like coffees and lunches and office gossip. And I have friends who've really struggled with their mental health because of this isolation, and I've personally found it really unbearable on some days. So how have companies been dealing with employees who are just feeling disconnected and lonely? The pandemic has. Is- Accelerated good things about the future of work, and it's also shone a light on many of the downsides. Isolation being one of them,、mm-hmm. leaders are taking the time to connect with employees, but it's hard. It's hard when it's not face to face, and you can't always、yeah. plan those. You know, you ask a. An employee question, you see the sort of human reaction, and you know that you need to spend more time with them or to help them. It's not the same when you're doing it on video. You know, we talked earlier about career advancement and people being worried about being out of sight, and it made me wonder who loses out by working from home. I just saw some data from a, a study that Microsoft did, and. One of the things they found is that young people, in fact, this was Gen Z, who are just entering the workforce,、mm-hmm. saying that they find it a lot more difficult to participate and use their voice and share their ideas on video calls versus face to face. Then you have women, which it's a large group, of course, but we are seeing when we look at data around who wants to work from home. Most or all of the time, you do see that being slightly more of a preference for women. 
And finally, I would say that it's also lower income workers who may not have the space, the quiet space in their homes to work. Uh, they may not have stable internet. People in remote locations mm -hmm. where there isn't the internet infrastructure, they're also at risk. I know people even in Toronto that live in areas where uh, they don't have, you know, they live in high rise buildings, for example, in lower income neighborhoods where they don't have stable internet and they have to turn off their videos during calls. We've talked about things like more productivity, desire for more flexibility, more human leadership. And I wonder what you think, if any, are going to be more permanent changes to our work culture when we have to go back to the office, whether it's through a hybrid model or, or full time. This idea of flexibility and choice versus a one size fits all, I think will take hold as well because we've proven it works. We've proven we can do it. And we've started to build more trust-based relationships. We have a long way to go in, in that area, but trust is the foundation of providing flexibility and choice. And I see that we've taken steps in that direction. That's it for today. I'm Tamara Kandacker. Our producers are Madeline White and Kasia Mihailovic. David Crosby edits the show. Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much to Zabine Hirji for coming on the show today. I am curious about what you all think. Have you liked working from home? Do you have any desire to go back to the office? Let us know. You can email us at thedecibel at globeandmail.com. You can tweet me at anima underscore TK. If you haven't already done it, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>